What's up, everybody? And welcome. There we go. What's up, everybody? And welcome to another amazing Palm Friday episode of Indie Game Business. Uh, we hope you're having a blessed day. My name is Indy. That gentleman next to me is Jay Powell from Powell Group Consulting. And welcome to Indie Game Business. We've got Dan from, he's the founder of Filament Games. The title for this session is Getting Grants for Indie Games and Discussing, discussing Educational Games. So this is going to get talk about multiple things like we always do talk about multiple things but i'm really excited for this one welcome dan <laughs> thanks good to be here hey dan all right so let's start with our favorite question tell us how you originally got into the industry and then walk us through your career up to this point because you've been doing this for a very long time like i have <laughs> okay well this will be boring for most people because it starts with a very educationally trajectory but basically what happened was I was I was in college as an undergrad. I was working at a supercomputing facility of all places, and they received a National Science Foundation grant to make virtual science museums. And so uh, we used pro, the software was called Joe. Uh, oh, now it's okay. I'm gonna see if hopefully it'll come back to me at some point. Um, it, it doesn't even matter because it was so terrible. Um, it should really be forgotten. It should be lost to time um, and buried and never unearthed. But um, basically, uh, it was um, a really, really clunky, I guess you could call it a game development engine that we used to make these virtual science museums. And they're pretty, um, in case the implication isn't clear already, these were pretty bad experiences um, used to teach about genetics. And uh, we did testing with Boys and Girls Club and other sources of middle school students, which is a weird way to put that. And they, they the students loved the experiences, even though they were really kludgy. And so the, there's this kind of light bulb moment of like, well, if this is bad, but it's quote unquote good in a way, um, then what would what would it look like if, if if it was actually good, if we actually utilized proper game development technology to its fullest potential? So at that point, I decided that I needed to learn more about learning. And so I went to get a graduate degree in learning sciences at University of Wisconsin-Madison, studying under the some of the seminal researchers doing research on game the intersection of games and learning at that point in time. And uh, emerged from that experience, well, I should say before emerging from that experience, decided that I wanted to put this into practice, put this this rhetoric about how the learning sciences can be applied to ed, to, to game game based learning into practice, um, because where I saw it being put into practice was mostly instances where um, people were making kind of candy coated quiz questions and calling them games and it was like and i was you know i grew up as a gamer very passionate about playing video games and i was like these these are not games these are these are quizzes in disguise and so um basically decided to start this company with my two founding partners dan or and alex stone our chief creative officer and chief technical officer respectively while i was still in grad school to put some of this rhetoric into practice and we basically started by doing um just pet projects we we said well what would it look like to make a game about the fall of rome and we uh, at that point used valve's hammer engine which um <laughs> i just remember spending like a week trying to get one of the npc characters to to actually uh, look in the right direction um man unity and other technologies have really come a long way and then uh, and then for my graduate thesis we were like well what, what would it look like to make a game about ocean science where you get to explore an alien planet and try to decode this ecosystem and use the tools of science in order to understand this ecosystem and and ended up through a lot of lucky and serendipitous opportunities getting to present that at a conference where more serendipity ensued and and one of the members of the audience was somebody who was funding the national geographics the jason project to make an ocean science curriculum and he was like apply for a grant and um if you if you get it um, we could pair this with a new ocean science curriculum that they're developing and so i had no idea how to apply for a grant I never applied for a grant before and um uh basically uh asked for a million bucks because I, I must have been feeling snappy that day and for some strange reason they gave it to this scrappy ragtag uh, uh young group of roustabouts who 
uh, aspired to make educational video games. And that's how we started the company. That's really how we kind of got the company off the ground and started hiring our first employees and and figuring out our dev processes. So that that's um, kind of a long winded way of of saying that it was a very circuitous route. I, I didn't originally intend to end up in the video game industry per se, um, just had this real sort of deep passion interest for how we could potentially leverage video games in the service of positive impact and learning. And it ended up becoming a company. It's, it's interesting because I know a lot of those same people at National Geographic and the days that, and God, you're right, some of those old, this is an educational game. It's like, no, this is a quiz game. This is yeah. all this is. This is yeah. no, nothing fancy here. But one thing that stands out there is it's easier to go in and ask for a million dollars even today if it's educational mm. than it is if it's games. And I don't know if that's... Depends who you're asking. <laughs> well, I mean, but yeah. yeah, it still is because it's... I, I see it with a lot of country delegations as well because we're seeing a lot of grants come up in the industry from different governments. And the catch is the game always has to be somewhat culturally relevant to whatever place mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. And so that always has seemed to be that linchpin behind a lot of the big grant monies is you have to impress the academics and you have to impress the, the politicians that are, are looking to do this. But it's a fantastic route to get in because, yeah, you got basically a million dollars in seed funding. Do, do we even want to ask what that game actually ended up costing? Oh, far less than that. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> we actually used that pot of money to make, um, I think, almost up to nine games with them as yeah. follow-ons. So, yeah, because we had our, oh my goodness, our expenses at that point were so, so laughably small. I mean, that was almost 20 years ago. And, you know, we were grad students, so we ate ramen and and costs basically nothing. <laughs> Lots so of we've made that Good million bucks go a long way. But not the 99 cent, or back then it was five for a dollar, Robin. Yeah, not, you exactly. know, exactly. The good shit. So tell us how the company has evolved from that stage into today, because y'all have worked on a lot of games. A lot of games. Yeah, we've made over 400 games at this point. And the way, so from there, it evolved very organically because we started, we, we developed those games uh, with Nat Geo and then, um, started showing those at conferences and spreading the word about the work that we were doing. And before I knew it, we had other organizations, usually at that point, mission-driven, not-for-profits. Our client base is more eclectic, more diverse these days. But at that point, it was mostly mission-driven, not-for-profits. Started knocking at our door, or researchers started knocking on our door and, and saying, hey, we're, you know, we're going out for this grant. Would you be interested in partnering with us? Or, or you know, we have this new set of learning objectives that we'd like to cover as part of this new a federally funded initiative or what have you. And um, all of a sudden it became clear that we had tapped into an, an actual market kind of inadvertently and that there was, uh, a, there was a, a, a client base to be had. And so, as I mentioned, it grew very organically from one client to the next. The more work that we did, the more we were able to talk about efficacy of game-based learning and the impact of the projects that we'd done. And, uh, and and the the lighthouse got brighter and brighter, and and more ships started coming into port. And uh, you know, fast forward almost twenty years, and and uh, four hundred or so games later, and we've had the opportunity to work with just an incredibly diverse mix of different types of organizations. Um, so from organizations like iCivics, that you know, founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, to try to teach. Um, to try to teach civics to middle school students and other starting to move in high school as well with just, um, oh man, I wish I could remember their stats off the top of my head, but they're used in all 50 states and they've just had millions and millions and millions of students and teachers engage um, across the years to um, VC funded startups, toy companies, textbook publishers, researchers, um, medical device companies using games as prescriptive intervention, just this really, really crazy mix of, of, of different types of organizations wanting to make games about totally different things. It's been a lot of fun. When was the last time you used the phrase edutainment? Uh, <clears throat> the last time that I felt like punching myself in the face, <laughs> which I don't <laughs> like doing very often. <laughs> 
Yeah, I like to say I like to talk about game-based learning, sort of GBL, and I like to, and and that's also a nice way to distinguish what we do from gamification, which is kind of like a cousin that focuses a little bit more on extrinsic motivation versus intrinsic motivation. But um, yeah, edutainment is that is a a term that I mean it's not I that that was a, an overly strong reaction. It's it's not a terrible term. I don't hate it. Um, it does in my mind. It's sort of synonymous with this bygone era of kind of like Oregon Trail and Reader Rabbit, and that was definitely that by that era was a mixed bag. There were some very good games at that time that I you know games that I would endorse from a learning sciences perspective and from a gameplay perspective, but. There were there was also a lot of shit at that point, yes. a lot of that drill, <laughs> aforementioned drill and skill, and a lot of, and part of the reason why I think I hate that term so much is because it it haunts me to this day. I can't tell you how many times I talk to somebody who, usually people my age, and I tell them what I do, and they're like, oh yeah yeah, read a rabbit, and I'm like, math blaster, no no, no number no. crunchers, <laughs> yeah. number crunchers, yeah no it's not, we've uh, we've gotten better. <laughs> We <laughs> believe it or not, like game technology and our sort of best practice and game-based learning development has improved across the decades. I, so, God, that that word, I I read it up there with gamification. The minute I'm in a meeting and somebody says either one of those words, it's just I have this internal <laughs> scream in the back of my head. Because generally, yes. they have no idea what they're talking about. Especially yes. a lot of the companies that aren't in the industry and they're like, we're going to put gamification in our project. And I'm like, you're going to put achievements. Let's just face it. That's what you're right. going to do. Yes. You're not you're actually going some to badges. do anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I, luckily, that term, the entertainment term, isn't used that much anymore. And yes. because I, it did, it got such a backlash because it was just so horrible. Yes. So, Oh, oh, so oh, actually, sorry, I just took no, no, aggression. I took a minute to look up those stats for I6. 100, and they're worth mentioning because they're phenomenal. 184 million plays in total that those games have had Damn. Uh, since we started working with them. 146,000 active teachers across all 50 states, 9 million <laughs> students. It's crazy. So, yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, there you wow. go. So, somebody just solved all our problems for monetization in, in game based learning. You just put a battle, oh, it's all it's all battle pass. soft money for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just put a battle pass. <laughs> battle pass. Yeah. Oregon Trail with a battle pass. That's yeah. that's all we need right there. Uh, you so get that, yeah, the battle pass. Uh, of course. Okay, now there's the obligatory dysentery joke. I'm not even gonna make it. You know, it, it's been that's played out. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So th the question everyone's gonna want to know first: Where in God's name do you go and find these grants? Mm -hmm. All sorts of different places. So a lot of, I mean, so there are a lot of federal grants. Um, the National Science Foundation has been a, a big funder of games and game-based learning interventions across the last couple of decades. The Department of Education has played a role as well. Every branch of federal, uh, every department of the federal government has a, um, has some sort of grant making program. And there are all sorts of different types of grants ranging from grants for small businesses uh, that are meant for commercialization assistance. They're kind of they're kind of like seed money or startup money or VC money, but structured differently. And then there are also um, grants that are more oriented toward research. And usually those have to go to some sort of nonprofit entity as a prime. Or a um, or a university or in, you know some sort of um, academic institution, and then uh, as a for-profit entity, for-profit game development entity, you can then also be a prime or a sub award. Or excuse me, a, not a prime, a sub award or a subcontract on those on those grants. There's also private foundation grants. There's a lot of private foundations out there: Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Gates Foundation, um, that have dabbled in game-based learning over the years. That was um, that. That's one that I hesitate to mention because that era, I would say that that was an era, and I, I wouldn't say that it's ended. But I would say there's a lot less activity among private foundations and in, in grant making for games and educational games in general, um, or I should say educational games and games in general, than there was say like 10, 10 or so years ago, and a lot of that is because I think private foundations tend to uh, focus a lot of their energy on whatever is kind of in the zeitgeist at the moment. 
and educational games were really sexy about 10 years ago these days it's you know ai and ai and ai <laughs> <laughs> and so um and so there's a lot and and even some of our nonprofit partners are feeling that pressure. I just got off a call with one of our nonprofit partners and their board and and other sort of investors that they they've been talking with are like educational games, from educational games. Like, what are you doing with AI and machine learning and you know? And so the, so it um, there's always kind of like the new glitz. There's the new shining object. Um, and it's actually I would say that is also true of the the federal agencies to a certain extent as well. Maybe to a little bit of a lesser extent. But um, the funding definitely, you know, when you're talking about grant funding, you're talking about some board like collection of people getting together to decide which proposals to greenlight, excuse me, and which ones to reject. And it, you know, it sort of stands to reason that those that collection of people are going to be most excited about the proposals that would purport to leverage some new and exciting and untested technology in some way because that's what a lot of grant making is about right it's about exploring new frontiers it's it lets you um, maybe for example like the sbir program is specifically for high risk endeavors that would be hard to get funding for from a more conservative venture capitalist who needs that rocket ship ride to the moon and the five-year exit or the hockey stick adoption curve right so a lot of these programs really are about how do you um leverage some new exciting technology in the service of say for example learning and sometimes that means that um things become uh, things come in and out of out of out of favor right so like after educational games, there's a period where we submit a lot of proposals around VR because VR was the new exciting hotness. And now a lot of our proposals have some sort of AI element in them. So uh, that's definitely something to be aware of when you're when you're when you're going for grant funding. But, and that's, but that's very similar to like the traditional game VC. It's, it's like whatever's hot oh, so. mm -hmm. is going to get a lot. And you know, I saw a stat from a friend of mine who was at g star over in korea and he mm. you know, it was right it was five months ago maybe it was in the midst of everybody going nobody has money mm. and then mm -hmm. he sends me this list that's like a giant spreadsheet of all the sponsored parties that were happening at g store and every single one of them was around web3 or ai and oh, so sure. it's yeah. like you know yeah it's risky but at the same time that what you're seeing in grants is what we see in in vc money a lot as well so yeah. you know from the game developer angle how does that affect the creative of what you're doing if you've been working on one track forever and then you all sit down and go oh shit the next four you know things that we have to submit need to be implementing vr or ai right, right. how do you handle that internally create i mean versus the creative side of this sometimes it's more skews so for example about six years ago we received national science foundation funding for a product a, a product to teach robotics which is now a game that's live on steam called uh roboco and we're just about to in may we're going to be launching the vr version of that experience called some assembly required on the meta quest and that is in no small part because we, we got follow-on funding um, through a variety of different grant applications to um to explore vr and so we said okay well what does it look like to take this ip and and um rejigger it for for a vr experience um same thing with mr we're going to be releasing an mr SKU of the experience in uh early 2025 in in large part because we found some funding some 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 soft money funding for um to develop out that experience because there was an investor who was particularly interested in that technology for ai there was a program called rapid that we applied to with carnegie mellon university robotics academy and the rapid is a, an interesting solicitation it's basically a solicitation that is geared toward um as the name kind of suggests really like cutting edge quick proposals small scale proposals to explore some new interesting angle technological angle and uh to fail fast um in in that particular instance and so we 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 said okay well we've got this robotics game what would it look like where you build robots in a sandbox <clears throat> what would it look like to 
add, integrate AI into that so that you're building with an AI partner and instead of um, you know, dragging parts into the space and, and attaching them together Lego-like and dragging in your motors and your pistons and your wheels and rods, et cetera. What if you sort of described to a machine learning algorithm what kind of robot you wanted and then co-designed your robot, co-built your robot with that, with that AI? And so we got that funded with with Carnegie Mellon, and now we are integrating that into Roboco. So, so in, in that in 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 the case of, um, I guess since we've had this robotics IP that we've been developing for six years, when there are new grant opportunities that present themselves, whether it's private or public, we try to think about how we could leverage some new technology into that existing IP to expand it in some interesting way and to extend its life. See, and this is interesting, and, and maybe you have to be like our age to really appreciate it, but I encourage everybody to, to pull up the Steam page for Roboco, and you're going to notice something. It's like very There's positive. There's a buy button, and you should press it. Yeah, what, <laughs> and buy it too, yes. Please. But the reason that the edutainment word is so vilified is because nine times, or shit, 95 times out of 100, those games suck. They yeah. were absolutely horrible. Your games don't. Why? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it's based on philosophy, right? So, like when when we started when we started uh, this company, the whole idea was like, how do we create authentic gameplay mechanics around interesting learning objectives? And when I say interesting learning objectives, I should back up and say that from our philosophical perspective, learning is inherently interesting and pleasurable. And that makes a lot of people gasp because we associate learning and education with school, which we associate with drudgery and, all, and a variety of other um, sort of pejorative ideas. And that's because school, I think in many, and I'm using this, obviously, I'm saying this very broadly, but um, in, in many ways, um, school, um, treats learners as a um, receptacle that information gets placed into. And um, and that's not how good learning actually works. Like good learning is, A, it's usually learner driven and it's usually curiosity driven, inquiry driven. And, um, and it's driven by um, interactivity, like hands-on interactivity. And, uh, and so we, we basically, from a philosophical perspective, we were like, well, how do we take, um, how do we create gameplay mechanics or a set of verbs that a player can interact with that authentically model some kind of interesting space that has value outside of the video game? And that's the only difference, right? Because like play any game for purely, you know, quote unquote fun, um, whether it's like Civilization or World of Warcraft or a shooter, I don't care, Call of Duty, like whatever you're learning things in all of those games. They're just not always things that are like, if, if maybe there's no transfer opportunity outside of the game into the real world, if there is maybe that information or those skills or perspectives don't have a lot of value in the real world. So we just try to make games that still look and feel and play like um, authentic games, but, but then whatever it is that you're learning in the game or whatever skill you're picking up, concepts you're learning about have value outside the game. And that's, that's the main difference. I think the big takeaway in learning from Call of Duty is that society and humans in particular are just horrible people. And then you can, <laughs> you can, you can build from there. But it, it's one of those things that I, I, it is very interesting because what you all have done is you've used grants in the educational space to you know, solidify yourselves as a real a quote unquote real game development because you look at Roboco on Steam, it does not look like it doesn't scream educational like a lot of right. stuff does. It's like, okay, here's just a funny, funny game about making robots to yeah. help squishy humans do shit. Um, <laughs> what I didn't, you should be in marketing, you that should be our special <laughs> synopsis. I'm gonna rewrite our synopsis. It's not necessarily marketing, it's just 25 <laughs> years of cynicism in this industry, it just boils, boils down to whatever, but. The, the really interesting thing here for a lot of the, the indie devs out there is how you can do this, do this well. And now you're, I mean, you're self-publishing Roboco. There's no publisher behind it. And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's realistically, yeah. how many publishers out there are going to pick up a game that even remotely says educational? Yeah. 
So okay. are you looking to take this to another level and actually become a publisher and start looking for other good games in this mm. genre to do? So we we did that for a spell, but school facing as opposed to entertainment facing. So we we developed a series of middle school science games and then we started bringing on and then we created a platform and then a school facing platform, teacher facing platform, and then started bringing on third party content to, uh, you know, so in science, math, and other sort of core peripheral subject areas, and tried to sell those to schools, which was an absolute nightmare. Yeah. So uh, the the question of would we ever consider becoming an entertainment or at home or sort of informal learning environment focused publisher, I think the question is um, unanswered at this point, And it depends a lot on whether or not we're able to make our own IP um, successful enough from an ROI perspective in order to make that investment. I think if it was, then we would do it without hesitation, without a second thought, because I think there are a lot of really great educational IPs that have significant amount of entertainment value um, and an increasing number all the time. You know, I think of games like Eco, for example, or Civilization, you know, games that like, um, are ostensibly for entertainment purposes, but may have been developed by somebody who from the outset was quietly cackling to themselves and thinking about the positive impact that they were gonna have on the world when they designed the experience. And I would love it if there was a go-to place for developers who had that type of aspiration to, um, to, to um, you know, get marketing and distribution support. The challenge I think is that you know cracking that code is is quite difficult because there's no obvious market for that type of product right it's like where does it live and you know you one one could argue well okay if you're going to make educational content that's going to be designed for at home use instead of institutional school use then it really needs to be targeted at um, young people age k5 because that's where that type of content is being purchased by parents because parents still have purchasing agency when their kids are K-5 after five, after fifth grade, um, the, the kids are deciding what they want to play. And usually that's a Minecraft or a Fortnite or, and they, they have, have no interest in, in playing something that even remotely smells like education. So you could argue, okay, well, if you're outside of that demographic, which if you're developing games for entertainment to publish on a platform like Steam or the Epic Game Store, then you probably are outside that demographic because those platforms really cater toward an older audience. Um, so, so then the question is, well, does does that audience see education as uh, educational value as a reason to buy a game above and beyond its inherent educational value and part of the the thesis that we're exploring with roboco is um can we make a commercially successful game without in any way advertising or leveraging its positive or educational benefit right like roboco is at its core is a systems thinking game where you are designing a robot to solve an, an interesting challenge and that's a game that's a set of game you know it's a gameplay loop that you see in other sandbox games so there was a hypo you know the hypothesis was there is a market for this type of experience for this genre of experience on a platform like steam um do we need to lean into the fact that this is an educational experience at all we ultimately decided no that it would be more of a liability than an asset to advertise it as such um because that as soon as you advertise it as such people in their minds are like oh that's for a younger audience and, and it's not we didn't want people to come to ro to write off roboco thinking that it was for a younger audience so in our view it's still i think the main reason that we wouldn't become a publisher of educational games on platforms like that is just that um uh there's still this kind of disconnect between the idea that somebody something can be educational but also be targeted toward an older audience and then if you flip that coin and look at the um you know games designed for a younger audience for that k5 audience that market from my perspective is just so saturated with garbage and rising above that noise is almost impossible because most parents don't have the literacy to distinguish the game literacy to distinguish between a high quality video game experience that is educational and one that is not 
See, the, the audience can't see me busting out laughing over here, but you can <laughs> because you are so right. But this is where the opportunity lies, and especially with NDFs, because I mean, let, let's face it, in the real game space, that's where the innovation comes from. Mm-hmm. That, that's where the new cool shit comes from. It doesn't come yeah. from Activision. It doesn't come from Ubisoft or EA. Right. They are very much that conservative route that you talked about earlier where, okay, if it's not going to sell 10 million units, we don't want to touch it. Um, right. Is it feasible for you know teams that have beta stage or even early stage indie games to be able to approach some of these grants and say, we're going to take what we've got here and we're going to apply what you need for the grant to it? Or do these things typically just need to be built from the ground up? It depends. I think some grants are really good fit for um, what, the stage where you have a proof of concept or you have something that can demonstrate an idea um, in an exciting way. Um, and other times it's other, other grants are really meant for, um, for something that's more greenfield and more more just like a pure paper-based concept. So for example, um, these days, if you apply for a Department of Education grant, they actually want to see that you've created an MVP, a minimum viable product, and you've done some initial efficacy testing to see whether or not it actually has positive impact or there's like any amount of data that suggests that what you're building actually could potentially have educational merit or value. Um, then there's, you know, instances I'm thinking about with Roboco in particular, where we had actually a pretty fully built out game and that opened the door to conversations with mostly in that case, private funders, um, or nonprofit, uh, organizations that we were able to partner with to go after private or public funding because we had something tangible and playable that they could sink their teeth into and say, oh yeah, this lines really nicely with our values and with our goals as an organization. And we would adopt this for our organization if only it had, say for example, in the case of um, RoboCo, we started up a conversation with the robotics the competitive robotics organization first, and they ended up funding the addition of Python programming the game so you can create entirely autonomous or hybrid intelligence robots in the game through Python scripting. So that's a very, very unique, I would say, um, example, but it, it, it only was feasible because we had something that was pretty mature when we started the conversation with them. We actually, and the way I know that for sure is we started the conversation with them far ahead of that when we didn't have the software available yet. And uh, we weren't able to get the conversation very far until there was actually something tangible. So it it really depends on on the program. Um, There are lots of programs out there that will fund an, an idea with absolutely no, without a single line of code behind it. But um, uh, there, are, there are definitely also programs as well that require you to have some data or some software. And, and that actually boils into the first question from Western Pearl Studios. And it was good seeing you at GDC. So thanks to the name there. Um, are there grants that can be awarded for robust documentation of how to make a game? I would say that there's a there is a grant out there that could potentially fund just about any idea. But the question, you just have to think about who your audience is. And right now when I'm saying audience, I don't mean the audience, like the end user of what it is that you ultimately want to build. I mean, the the panel of people who are going to be reviewing your proposal and deciding whether or not it has merit as a target for funding. So if you're applying for, you know, like a Unity for Humanity grant, then then your idea needs to, in some way, think about how you can advance their objectives as an organization, while at the same time um, meeting your own objectives as an organization. So where is that overlap in the Venn diagram? And for a lot of solicitations, they're pretty broad, right? So like you can reasonably justify some amount of overlap between what you want to do and what they want to do assuming that you're willing to be a little bit flexible about your vision. Um, But a lot of times with grants, and this is something that's a little bit different than I would say funding from publishers, for example, or VCs, is with publishers and VCs, typically you go to them with this idea or this vision or this thing that you want to bring into life that you're super passionate about, and you have designed it down to a specific T. Whereas I would say with the grant space, because the funder already comes with their own agenda 
And like I said, sometimes that agenda is very specific, sometimes it's broader. But because they come with their own agenda and their own areas that they focus on and the type of impact that they want to have, um, you often, I think, find yourself um, manipulating your, um, th th figuring out how to mold or shape whatever it is that you're passionate about to fit the grant to some extent, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the grant. Like, I think it requires more malleability on the vision side of the developer. So that's a long way of saying yes, but, but, but you would need to find a solicitation for that idea. And I think it was a documentation, some like a documentation idea, like you would need to find a funder who had a solicitation uh, that aligned in some way with your with your documentation vision or figure out how to frame your documentation vision in a way that um, meets their objectives as a funder. In many ways, it's almost exactly the opposite of how we tell indie devs to pitch to publishers because I right. constantly tell them, do not yes. aim a pitch specifically at a publisher because at the end of the day, you don't really know what their, right. what their goals are and just pitch the game you want to make. But in this case, yeah. you have to have an idea of the game you want to make, but be willing to very much target it to, you know, right. whatever that funding you know, organization's agenda is. I totally agree. And this is this was something that was, I think, culturally challenging for Filament when we started talking to publishers because we did do, we did pitch RoboCo. There was a, a hot a hot second there where we were pitching RoboCo to publishers when it was a young IP. Um, and as a organization that has typically operated as a services business is where clients come in, they hire us and they're like, here's a set of learning objectives. Let's collaboratively design an experience that meet these learning objectives and meets our goals as an organization. Um, we found ourselves culturally having to adapt a little bit when we were talking to game publishers because they don't want you to show up with a sort of collaborative design mentality and be like oh what do you think is interesting okay yeah we could try that they want you to be like this is the vision it's going to rock it's going to be i mean just like pitching to vcs right they want you to project that confidence they want to know that you've done the diligence on the market that you have an idea that is going to sell a lot of copies and um and, and there are no ifs ands or buts whereas in the services space you know if, if we had that attitude or culture, then a lot of our clients would get scared off, right? Because we need to have a certain amount of flexibility to, um, and their voice needs to be part of the conversation, particularly if it's a subject matter expert or something of that nature. So yeah, that was definitely a learning experience for us as an, as an entity. Where do you draw that line between, okay, we understand that this is your objective and this is what you want to do, but that's going to translation translate into a really shitty game experience <laughs> for uh that's a that's a great question oh man we have we we what we t we walk that that tightrope a lot and um it's really like it requires i think a lot of diplomatic um accoutrement to <laughs> to tell to tell somebody that their their game idea is terrible and i think that's true across the board whether or not you're talking to a client or a 10 year old who's super <laughs> about their vision um because as you might imagine as a game company we get a lot of like our you know our in, inbound um inquiry form we get a lot of people who are pitching us game ideas and they're like i had the coolest idea for an educational game will you make this idea please um but yeah, notwithstanding that, um, it's very, I think, challenging to tell anybody that their idea sucks, whether it's a game idea or, or anything else. And as you might imagine, in the educational game space, we have to do that perhaps more than usual because um, we work with a lot of people whose background is education. And a lot of those people don't play games or um, know much about yeah. games or in some cases know anything about games and so sometimes their sensibility is entirely informed I, I can't tell you how many times i've had i've been in conversations with organizations where their entire perspective on what we should do is informed by what their niece is playing or oh my god yes or what, yes. Their, or what their kid is playing or said about a game 
Uh, and that's that's really challenging, right? Because you don't want to be like, like your kid's stupid. That's even worse than being like your idea is stupid. Than being like your kid's idea is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that is ultimately the message that we we have to communicate in many cases. And so it's really just a question of how we um, explain not, you know, we sort of, it's a yes and moment. We're kind of like shifting away from like critiquing that idea and thinking more about how we can take the, perhaps the atomic unit of that idea that maybe has some promise and then mold it into something that would make more sense as a as a game loop it's obvious you have a lot of experience dealing with these people and you deal with them in a much better way than i used to because you can i am available for hire bring me in on these calls i will absolutely tell these people that their kids games su idea suck i've done it my entire life <laughs> And it's part of the reason that every now and then somebody on an airplane asks me what I do. And I'm like, I sell insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know the minute I say I oh, work in games, yeah, got they're going to be like, I have this great idea. Yes. Like, fuck, here we go. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and we've but, all had them. We've all had that idea, right? We've all, we've all been there. We've all so, been the guy with the dumb so idea. Sparrow bird on, on, I lost my mouse pointer there for a second. Um, if I have another researcher talk to me about their kid playing Fortnite, I will die. But this is what I have to explain to a lot of these. When we're talking to grant companies, and I haven't dealt with a lot of educational ones lately. They're usually government-based. And that's what I have to explain to them. It's like, look, I we can make the game that talks about the history of your country and all this other stuff. But you have to realize if it's not as entertaining as something like Fortnite, kids ain't going to play it. That, I mean, that, that's what you're competing against. Yeah, if it's up to them, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you all have been doing Roblox stuff, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so how do you see that as a platform, be it Roblox or, you know, Fortnite? Because Dan and I were talking about backstage about you can use Legos in creative mode now. Mm -hmm. How do you see that market growing in terms of a platform mm. for these types of games? That's a great question. Well, the first thing I should do is give a shout out to the Roblox Community Fund because that's how we funded the game that we've developed for Roblox, which is called Robot Champions. And that is also a spin off of Roboco. So it's basically a robotics, a multiplayer robotics game on the Roblox platform where you build robots and then play in sport arenas against other people who have designed their own robots, um, which I encourage folks to check out. And uh, to your to your question, so that, that is that is definitely one way to get a an educational or impact oriented game funded for the Roblox platform, Roblox Community Fund, and that is uh, active right now. <clears throat> um, but don't apply for it because then you'll be competing with us. <laughs> I, and I will give you the link to that in six months. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and um but to your to your question so so roblox is in the process of making an edu facing version of the platform that would be used in schools so that's a st still a big question mark is what will the adoption be in in the school setting and how um how will teachers and administrators take to the idea of roblox even a, a school a, a version of the platform that's intentionally developed for for the school environment because roblox doesn't have I would say like the best reputation among edu the education community right now. Um, but I think they're doing a really great job at improving that and in no small part because they're bringing on partners that have a great reputation with um, with schools and with educators and bringing them to the fold of the Roblox Community Fund. Um, but then outside of that, just in terms of like the, the future of Roblox as a platform for educational experiences for at home use, um, you know, it's it's interesting because um, this is, so the release of Robot Champions was our first free to play game, um, that we've ever done as a studio. So the, you know, big learning curve there in terms of like trying to figure out how to, you know, maximize your daily active users and your retention and, and all your, your, your metrics, um, and then get people to engage with 
a store so that you have sustainability. And it's been, I'll admit, it's been a challenge for us as a, as a studio because we are an, a positive impact oriented studio. And there are a lot of things about monetization and player retention on free to play platforms like Roblox that we find a little bit unsavory. And so the question is like, where, where is, where's the no fly zone for us as an entity, like things that we just won't touch. And then where is the, um, where's the safe zone and then where are the things that maybe stretch us a little bit outside of our comfort zone that we would consider exploring in order to find a sustainability model on a platform like this because I do think the thing that's amazing about Roblox from an educational perspective is you do have the ability to just reach a crap ton of students or young people really fast and that is definitely a unique asset of that platform over something like steam or or um other sort of premium game download install platforms that are just that just don't work for a lot of younger people um so uh so yeah i think there's tremendous potential there to for for educational impact and tremendous potential to get a lot of i mean we've you know, relatively short period of time had over a million plays on Robot Champions. Um, and, you know, we, we can't say the same for Steam, that's for sure. Um, so so the, the ability just from a straight up like metrics and impact perspective, that's really cool. But um, on the flip side of that, there also it does feel like a, a bit of an uphill battle in terms of fighting the cultural norms of that platform. And what do I mean by that? Well, a couple different things. One is like player attention span, right? So like we're trying to make, you know, Roboco and Robot Champions and robotics in general, like we're trying to make these deep, meaty experiences that are very intellectual, very cognitive, where, you know, you get in, you think long form about the type of robot you want to build, you tinker with your design, um, you play matches, you go back and iterate. So like, we're asking players to lift a relatively heavy cognitive load um, on a platform where a lot of experiences are, let's just say, like more Tiger King than David Attenborough documentary, right? <laughs> like, it's a lot more just Wait, like you're working on a Tiger King game. Is that <laughs> <laughs> no? Uh, it's, it's a lot more like uh, what's a nice way to say it? I don't know if there's a nice way to say it. I mean, just just game like like Adopt Me, right? Like, sorry to you know, I shouldn't use a particular example, but games games that like are you know, I I don't necessarily like mean to cast aspersions but games that are not taxing from an intellectual perspective um and that's where a platform like steam a, you know a game like roboco is a little bit more at home on a platform like steam because there are lots of other games and, and communities of gamers that frequent platforms like steam that are um totally accustomed to playing games that are intellectually stimulating and challenging and I would say that's a little bit less of the case on the Roblox platform, where there's a little bit more of a culture of of channel flipping, like, oh, this is too, you know, like, I'm not instantly entertained within the first five seconds flip. It, and I think that's its challenge for education, yeah. You're basically running a development studio, a traditional publisher, and a free-to-pay publisher while doing education grants. Yes. How Not the big bad. thing to me on Roblox, and yeah, I know, really, <laughs> seriously, the, the big thing to me, and I watch my son and, and his friends play it, and I look at a lot of those games and some of the very, very popular ones that they play, and I'm like, mm -hmm. that game sucks. Why are you playing that? Yes. But you're right, the audience is there. I mean, how did you tackle the discoverability issues on, is it, is it just a crapshoot? So we're, I mean, that is definitely an ongoing challenge. Um, we, I mean, we do spend money on, on advertising on the platform and that helps, I think some amount, but like any of these platforms, there's an algorithmic flywheel that can spin in either direction. And it can, you know, if you, if you catch it in the right direction, then you get more and more and more users. And if you catch it in the wrong direction, the same true of Steam or any of these other platforms, then it just buries you. And I would say that like the Roblox algorithm is perhaps more forgiving than it is on platforms like Steam in our experience so far. Um, but that's not to say that it's easy. What I think you can get with Roblox that is hard to get on other platforms is you can get a steady stream of players coming through your experience. Um, but then like breaking through um, 
like that steady stream is not necessarily going to be huge, even if it is if it is steady. Um, and that's really cool because you can do a lot of A-B testing. You can constantly experiment with different features and see what resonates with the community, what doesn't, whereas you can't really do that as much on Steam, even in early access. Um, but then the challenge is like breaking out of the like the masses, right? Because there is so much content on the platform, just break it, like rising above that noise to get to the next tier of discoverability. And that we've found to be very challenging on that platform. And, and again, as I mentioned before, in particular with a game that um, is uh, intellectually challenging and therefore has, I think, lower reten player retention rates than you, you might find with, um, a game that's easier to get into. Have you... <laughs> <laughs> Tiger King, the game, could be meaty. Too. <laughs> <laughs> nice chaotic insight. Um, <laughs> have you experimented? I mean, whenever we see Roblox and Fortnite and things like that, to me, I mean, I see the very same parallels that we see with new platforms coming out, new stores coming out, we watched the very same thing happen with the GBA and the early handhelds from Nintendo years ago. And they solved mm -hmm. a lot of that by slapping a license on it. Mm -hmm. Have you, yeah. is that feasible when you have a grant? I mean, can you say, okay, we're, we're not just making robots. It's Tony Stark making robots. And therefore, I mean, is that even right. an option is, or, or the Oh, it's certainly, is? yeah, it's, it, it, it definitely is. And in, and in fact, um, I've often thought that um, that is the number one thing that we could do, whether on Steam or on Roblox, to have better traction and discoverability. And it's um, as much as it pains me to say it, at this point in these platforms that are mature and hypersaturated with content, particularly post pandemic, I, I do think that having some sort of IP or license associated with your content is it's increasingly starting to feel like the the bare minimum if you want to have like a reliable chance of success obviously all those platforms are always going to have that casino like possibility for success they're going to be those indie darlings that rise above the noise and get lucky but um you know it's kind of like with a college degree like for our parents like a college degree was a a nice to have and then for my generation it was like a need you know like more more of a need to have but um you, you know now it's just sort of like the expectation right like what like that's like high school is mandatory but then college is also mandatory and if you don't have a college degree then uh then who are you and why are you even attempting to enter the workforce um that's kind of how it's starting to feel for me for licensed ip so we've definitely explored um partnerships like that but i but i feel like um uh there's there's definitely there are a lot of ips out there that i think are a great fit for educational content and um and will improve discoverability and adoption on the back end even if it really shouldn't be the case um and and i think that is also true when it comes to getting the grant itself right so like a lot of the um like some of the grants that like in, in in some cases when we got grants it was because we were able to name drop previous funders or partners right and so i think if you're applying for fund and i think this is true whether you're talking about the grant space or not like if you're applying for funding and you can be like oh and we're also partnered with this ip it dramatically increases your chance because the, the funder the people reviewing the funding proposal just know that there's a, a much higher likelihood that it will actually uh be adopted if there's an IP, a, an exciting ip associated with it well, I mean, I'm just saying hypothetically, I do know of a consulting firm that can, you know, help with that part of the <laughs> what? licensing. They're yeah. above you. Yeah. It's right, you just yeah, have to pan your camera up. I can't see. No. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm shameless plugging myself. All right. We're going to, we've got about seven or eight minutes because it is a holiday and everybody's on a schedule here. So we're not going to let everything go too long. So if you've got questions, pop them in here. Uh, what are the most common obligations to the indie dev for grants? And what are some of the top things to look out for when searching for solicita yeah, solicitations? 
Okay, common obligations that are pet. So a lot of grants have report, they require frequent reporting and somewhat onerous reporting. Um, the application itself obviously is the main requirement and that is also often extremely challenging. So in the case of SBIRs, which we've applied for a fair number of over the years, the small business innovation research grants, uh, the application process is like, hey, um, get ready to not do anything else for like the next three months and just focus in on that. A lot of them have very esoteric language, like specialized language. They're not designed for a game development audience. They're designed for researchers um, or like in the case of say like National Science Foundation, a lot of the language is geared toward organizations that are fabricating some sort of new material that didn't exist before in a laboratory or doing or like if it's NIH then some some intervention that involves really high-tech medical equipment and so a lot of the language um, in the solicitations or in the RFPs will feel very foreign to people applying for these funding sources the other thing is there's often a research obligation that comes along with it so whether that's research that you're conducting as the prime or the grantee or you're partnering with a third party firm, uh, there's oftentimes a development phase and then like it's R&D, right? It's like there's often a development phase and then there's a research phase where you're doing some, signed, some kind of RCT, random, uh, randomized control trial. Um, and uh, and then there's data reporting on the back end of that. And then sometimes, as I mentioned before, the grants want you to come in with data, maybe that's from a previous round of a grant or from um, just diligence that you've done on your own. So that's where it can be really handy to partner up with somebody who knows how to do data collection. And, um, and whether that's an individual faculty member at a university or college or a, a private research uh, firm. So that's the, um, those are some of the obligations. And then the, what was the second half of the question? What to look out for when you're doing solicitations? Oh, solicitation, right. Yeah. I mean, so I, I think I would just echo what I said before is like, look for that organic alignment between the objectives of the granting organization and the specific grant and your goals as an organization. So, so there's kind of two tiers to that. Like every solicitation or RFP will have specific goals associated with it. And then the organization that puts out that solicitation will also have overarching goals as well and the extent to which you can align with with both of those tiers of goals the better what is the best educational game you've ever seen and what contributes to a good educational game well obviously roboco is the best educational game i've ever seen but <laughs> and it's getting a battle pass <laughs> and she... <laughs> exactly um but what contributes to a good educational game so I think that, but but I'll, I'll actually quote, I'll, I'll cite Civilization as maybe what I considered the best educational game before I started making my own educational games way back in the day, even though they don't really try to, like one of the things I should say, having confirmed this with the folks at Firaxis, like if there's ever a moment where fun comes into conflict with the educate with educational um, value, you know, fun wins. And that's something that we don't have the luxury of doing as an education, um, studio, but um, uh, you know, um, in a, I think I think there is definitely merit to the way they do it because you know a lot more people play Civilization than Roboco, so I would rather reach a larger audience with an experience that makes some compromises. But that's a whole separate tangent. Oh, now I, I yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've often wondered how many kids over the years have submitted reports on Gandhi talking about his nuclear stockpile. <laughs> because, you know, when you talk about Civ being educational, it's like, yes. yeah, Gandhi's firing nukes everywhere. That That's the, um, that's the, that's what you're taking away from this game. I once um, made a History Channel style, like mock documentary about my Civ game uh, narrative that, that, uh, was a lot of fun, but, oh, just to, just to put a bow on that, what makes for a good educational game? I think in my, in my view, like a game that explores an interesting system, right? So like in, in Roboco, for example, the system at the core of the experience is designing robots that can solve problems. And, um, I am, I'll, I'll always be a big fan of open-ended systems that give the player a lot of agency to make their own decisions about what to do and what not to do and how to solve the problems. And part of the, and 
and I think in some ways that's a reaction again to like how education traditionally works within brick and mortar schools, which is the, ed, the, the learner has a relatively small amount of agency about how they solve the problem. And then the problem usually has a right or a wrong answer. And as we, as we know, as adults and as game developers in particular, there's no such thing as like right and wrong answers. There's always shades of gray and nuance. And usually there's many right answers and many, many, um, answers that are wrong on a spectrum of wrongness. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, that's one of the, I think, frustrating, but also beautiful and colorful things about the real world. And so I think games are uniquely positioned as a medium to sort of impart that type of learning to, to young people. Well, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be strictly educational. I mean, you mentioned yeah. the History Channel style documentary there mm -hmm. 15 years ago, however long. History Channel was using the Total War games to do actual right. documentaries about the Roman legions and, mm -hmm. and all of which I always thought was very cool. Those games weren't necessarily built to be educational, right? but the tools that they had in it and the technology and the assets were being used for something totally you know, educational. Yeah, um, totally. All right, Game Dino, I'm going to split your question up and paraphrase here. So first question, the first half of this question, if a team, so, so Game Dino explains that their team is jointly based in, in Eastern Europe and mm -hmm. the Philippines, which brings up the question, does geographic location and factor in to applying for some of these grants, mm. aside yeah. from the government grants? We know that like, if you're going to do the, the game on the, the ancient history of Peru, then yeah, you probably need to be based in Peru. But how does company structure factor into this? Do you all need to be centrally located? Do they need to say, okay, here is an actual honest to God office or are, are these grants open to companies that are spread out around the world? Um, totally depends on this. So there are with, in some cases there, there are um, grants that are region specific. So for example, I have some game development friends who live up in Canada who are eligible for grants specifically because they live in Canada that we are not eligible for here in, in the United States of America um, and vice versa, obviously. So there are definitely regional, regional um, region specific solicitations. Um, but I would say for the most part, most grant programs are region agnostic and certainly don't require you to have a, a, a physical HQ, especially, especially these days. So the second half was, you know, they mentioned someone on their team is a person with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Are there any grants that you know of that are aimed for developers with disabilities? And the next question is when we're reaching, when they're reaching out, does that person need to be the one applying or is there someone else that is it okay for someone else to apply as long as that person's on their team? There are grants that are designed for interventions targeted at end users with disabilities. I'm definitely aware of those. I'm not aware of grants that are specifically designed toward um, developers with disabilities, but I would imagine it would be a, a feather in one's cap when applying for a grant to design and develop an experience for an audience um, that has some manner of disability to themselves uh, be intimately familiar firsthand with that disability. So, um, uh, yeah. All right, last last one, mm -hmm. and, then, and then we'll let you go plan your travel and, and get on with your holiday weekend. Are grants for for the STEM field mm -hmm. more numerous or easier to get than grants for non-STEM educational games? You know, that, that has been my experience, but at the same time, I am biased because um, we often are specifically looking for step you know to design stem experiences so uh I, there there's a certain there's a certain amount of like probably confirmation bias there but um uh particularly i think for nsf and department of education like for grant programs that are specifically um for the education field um stem has been you know the focus for the last decade or so i think that's started that has that has started to change and is changing um and there's no reason why um anybody should be scared about applying for educational um subject areas that are outside of stem but um there is a lot of like a lot of the literature a lot of the research backing for the use of games and education and justification for the use of games and education that you might cite in a proposal for example 
uh, ties to, you know, is based on research of STEM experiences and geared toward how to get more young people interested in STEM. That's certainly the, the tact that we took when we were uh, applying for uh, grants around Roboco initially. So it's a great question. And my, I want to say yes, but I, I don't actually know that for a fact. Now, Maddie, I can tell you the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> From my experience on both sides of that coin, there are far more grants. Now, you, you have to make sure that you qualify for them, but there are far more grant opportunities on the education STEM side than you're going to get in the traditional game side. But yeah, Dan, thank you for all of this and, and, I, and i'll let i'll let andy take over from here I really yeah this is amazing. amazing thank you so much dan i just posted the link to roboco in both in discord and in the chat if anybody wants to check it out i see i love you do. how your humans walk by the way that's <laughs> absolutely freaking hilarious anyway go ahead yeah so uh also there's a link scrolling across the screen uh where all of our links are link it's our link tree just link tree indie game business which get some indie game business merch look at jay's head Right, I don't have this my hat is special. On. You I can't get this on the store. Though. This is the ones that I had made up for the team. So that's top that. secret that you can't it's get. Exclusive. So um, look at look at what you can't get. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Actually, I you know what I saw someone uh, walking around at GDC with a hat. Yeah, you did. It's red. Red mm -hmm. is the only like non because I promised after I called him out. <laughs> One of the Discord, not Discord chats, but one of the WhatsApp chats. I said, if you find me at GDC, I got a hat for you. Yeah, that was red. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chaotic said, what was the name of the Roblox game? I need my kids to play something other than Find the Floppa. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a Roblox game. Yeah, <laughs> one. Wow. Um, it's called Robot Champions. It's funny because right before this uh, call, I was in a meeting where we were looking at the analytics for Robot Champions. And we made some significant changes to the tutorial recently, and we thought they were going to have a huge impact on the analytics, either driving them up or down, and they had no impact whatsoever. And I was so frustrated, and I said to the team, just make a, make a room with a pile of poop in the middle, and let's see, because I just want to see the analytics change. <laughs> I want to do something that's experience that changes how people react. Like, are people even, like... Are their brains on at all when they hey, come? Dan, in this you should know by now. Nobody plays a tutorial unless you make them do <laughs> you, it. You know what? You can you can come back and discuss the pile of poop analytics. We would love to. Yeah, I think it could to. go. Uh, it's, I mean, yeah, I think if, if honestly, if we did it, we would probably if we if we released pile of poop on Roblox, we probably would get more players, and then I would really have to question my life choices. Well, Beautiful. I'm making notes now because I'm going to start developing a Roblox. There's game. my I great game idea. idea. <laughs> right. Hey guys, I got this new game idea. Pile of poop. Pile of Here's poop. the pitch. <laughs> I mean, but in all honesty, now, now we're like really getting off on a tangent. In all honesty, look at Nickelodeon back in the days when we were growing up. And it was all just gross shit. Dig, dig up a, a giant nose in snot to try to find a Sorry. card or whatever. The, <laughs> what was that game? Double Dare? It was all just like gross uh, shit. Double I Dare. Mean, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Mm. When you get past. slimed. Oh, uh, yeah. Back in the double day. Double Dare. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, our Discord, if you're not on our Discord, you must, you need to join it. Discord.gg slash Indie Game Business. Also go to Indie Game Business or Indie Game Business.com. Excuse me. Is Either one. Old, they all go to the same place. Yeah. Indie Game Business.com. Sign up for the newsletter. We've got the list of publishers and list of Jay. In investors. 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 We say it quite. Investors and publishers. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everyone awesome. enjoy Great weekend. Dan. Keep keep fighting the good fight and making games that teach people stuff and don't suck. Yeah. So, the happy Easter. Did you know that was our original slogan? Educational games that don't suck. Yes. Okay. Except you can't right. use the word educational game because then nobody will play it. Yeah, exactly. Games That's that one. don't suck, or suck. Well, you might learn suck something anymore either. At least not yeah. to, not in schools. But anyway, yes. Thank you. Yes, that, we will continue doing that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody.